They used to say that a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to put its boots on. And that was before social media. Now the idea that the entire Liverpool squad are fraudulently registered asthmatics, Barcelona teammates sent secret codes to gun-smuggling Syrian rebels during the 2012 El Clasico, and Paolo Dybala doesn't exist, and they are all real theories that some people actually believe, I didn't just randomly make them up, can get the entire way around the world before anyone responds, hang on a minute, did you just say gun-smuggling Syrian rebels? It's a weird old world that we live in, and sometimes it can be hard to know what to believe. I mean, the idea that Alvaro Morata is used by Europe's elite as a money laundering exercise sounds ridiculous, sure, but then again, so too does Barcelona paying Juventus 65 million euros for Miralem Pjanic on the exact same day that Juventus paid Barcelona 82 million euros for Artemelo, as both teams sort of balance the books and avoid sanctions, and yet, Allegedly, that actually happened. There's no shame in falling for the odd myth here and there then, we're all fallible, but some would appear to be particularly prevalent and durable. The idea that simply getting or taking the ball, for example, even if your follow through quite literally sides your opponent in two and they bleed out to death in front of you, means that a tackle can't possibly have been a foul, let alone a red card offence, or, on the flip side, that fouling someone as, quote, the last man means that it is automatically a red card, have both impressively stood the test of time. For the record, even before the rules were revised, to make that a yellow card offence inside of the box if there was a genuine attempt to play the ball, to avoid the double jeopardy of going a man down and conceding a penalty, the law was never being the last man, but rather denying a clear goal-scoring opportunity. Of course, often it would be the last man who did that, but not always, and it's a pretty important distinction that, you know, you'd hope football commentators might know. Oh, and if I had a pound for every time that the bloke who sits behind me at Hull City said, we never score from short corners, including last week, less than 10 minutes after we had literally scored from a short corner, I'd have enough money to buy a season ticket and donate it to someone with a brain. Still, it makes a nice change from him moaning about rainbow laces and refugees. Without further ado then, because I've already covered all of the myths about the man that they called the next Pele in a feature-length documentary, here are just some of the biggest myths in modern football that are nonetheless still widely believed to be true. Seventh, Claude Makalele invented a new position. I loved Claude Makalele as a footballer, make no mistake, but this one does my head in. Whenever there's a discussion about the best holding midfielders, greatest combined 11s, or just specifically about Makalele himself, someone will invariably chime in with quotes, he literally invented the position, or he was so good they named the role after him. This I position. Like <laughs> position. Which is why I feel like this argument already speaks for itself, but Claude Makalele literally revolutionised that position. It's very hard, and in fact, it's basically impossible to argue against the guy who defined an entire position. But just because of the fact that he defined the role, I've got to give this one to uh, Lewis, and I've got to give it to Makalele, mate. It, it was that was just in one video. In reality, great though he undoubtedly was, Makalele didn't invent anything. It is telling that the so-called Makalele role is only called the Makalele role in England because it was only really revolutionary in a Premier League context. The 4-4-2 was ubiquitous in English football throughout the 1990s and into the early 2000s, and in Makalele's first season at Stamford Bridge, he actually partnered Frank Lampard in central midfield within a four-man midfield under Claudio Ranieri. Jose Mourinho was one of the first managers to implement a 4-3-3 in the Premier League during the 2000s though, giving Makalele a much deeper role as a midfield anchor or destroyer sat in front of his formidable back four, and the end result was the most miserly defence of the Premier League era. In the 2004-05 season, Mourinho's first at the bridge, Chelsea only conceded 15 Premier League goals, and Makalele's shielding was a key part of that. None of that changes the fact that midfield anchors and destroyers had existed for most of the last 100 years up to that point. 
Heck, Mourinho only implemented the same system at Chelsea that had won him a Champions League at Porto, where the uber-defensive Costinha, renowned for his positioning, work rate, and athleticism, just like Makalele, performed an almost identical role to the Frenchman in West London. Before that, Lota Mateus performed a similar role for a period of time, as did Frank Reichard. You will find Clodaldo doing something very similar if you go back and watch Brazil at the 1970 World Cup. And if you want to go back even further than that, the so-called Makalele role is near enough indistinguishable, except for the fact that it was within a 4-3-3, to the role that Julio Varela performed so expertly for Uruguay at the 1950 World Cup. In conclusion, it is a position as old as time then that was neither invented nor even revolutionised by Claude Makalele. You could say that Makalele repopularised the role in English football and became the template for it in England from the mid-2000s onwards, but that is an altogether very different claim to the one that is routinely erroneously made. Sixth, Paolo Maldini and Franco Baresi's goals conceded. Paolo Maldini and Franco Baresi are two of the greatest defenders of all time. Of that, there can be no doubt. AC Milan legends, club captains, and one club men with a combined 1,621 appearances for the Rosaneri between them, Maldini and Baresi's careers overlapped by more than 10 years. Unsurprisingly, during that time, AC Milan were a special team with a particularly outstanding defence. Blessed not only by Maldini and Baresi, but also the likes of Alessandro Costacorta and Mauro Tassotti. In their 12 seasons together, during the pinnacle of Serie A's glory days, Maldini and Baresi won 16 trophies, including 5 Scudettos and 3 European Cups. That, in of itself, is impressive enough. But as is so often the case in football, and in life more broadly, people feel the need to embellish. That is why, all over the internet, you will see it claimed that Maldini and Baresi played 196 games together as a centre-back pairing at AC Milan, and in those nearly 200 matches, they conceded just 23 goals. Here it is, courtesy of such reputable publications as Sport Bible, Odds Bible, I am just surprised that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and Paul neglected to mention it in the OG Bible, Football Away Days, Football Italia, Football Iconic, about 500 different TikTok accounts, and of course, the holy grail of reliable information, hard-hitting journalism, and well-sourced facts, The Sun. You may laugh, but this claim has been repeated so many times now that you'd be surprised at how many people believe it. You might even have been one of them, until now, having read it 4,000 times from 300 different publications, and assumed that it therefore must be true. There is just one small problem. It is total fiction. And I don't just mean that it's a rounding error, and maybe it was 29 instead of 23 goals, as the Odds Bible post claimed, despite Sport Bible sticking with the original 23. There are obviously some internal ruptures over at Bible HQ when it comes to totally made-up statistics. I mean that it is absurdly wrong and laughably inaccurate. The article in The Sun described the stats as, quote, Quite astonishing, which is true, much as it is quite astonishing that I can beat prime Usain Bolt in a 100 meter sprint and recently went on holiday to the Andromeda Galaxy, where I was surprised to discover that, though two and a half million light years away from Earth, they too have a chain of Greggs. Astonishing, I know. To put it in some perspective, Maldini and Baresi conceding 23 goals in 196 games as a centre-back pairing would mean conceding, on average, just one goal every eight and a half games, or about one every 800 minutes, and about four and a half goals a season. Now, they were very good, as was the entire AC Milan team that they both played in, and Serie A was a relatively low-scoring league at the time, but in the words of Roy Hodgson... So, so you know, let's, let's not take the piss here. I, I certainly wasn't. Well, I think you are. Defensively, the best season that the duo ever had was the 1987-88 campaign, in which they still conceded 22 goals at all competitions, so just one goal shy of the amount that they're meant to have conceded over nearly 200 games. In the 1988-89 season alone, in which Maldini and Baresi played practically the entire campaign as a centre-back pairing, the Rosaneri conceded 38 goals. Basically, there are two possibilities here. 
either someone was feeling a bit mischievous and decided to come up with a totally ludicrous statistic and tried to see how many people would actually buy it, the answer being lots of people, or someone misunderstood the stat that they conceded an average of 23 goals a season together, which may well be true, it is difficult to get 100% accurate reporting when it comes to which games Maldini played at centre-back versus left-back, and the confusion stems from that. Either way, the myth is just that. Just as an aside, or a bonus myth if you like, I have seen the Paolo Maldini quote that, if I have to make a tackle, then I've already made a mistake so many times. Again, from the same disreputable sources. And whilst I can't disprove that he ever said it, I've never seen it be sourced or a video of him saying it. And if he did indeed say it, it is a stupid quote. There are times in which an offender lunging in may be evidence of poor positioning or decision making, but there are also times in which making a tackle is the best or even the only feasible option, and it isn't remotely the fault or mistake of the defender in question that they find themselves in that position. Maldini himself, for crying out loud, was famed throughout his extremely decorated career for being one of the best slide tacklers in the game. Does that mean that he was actually rubbish and incredibly error prone? There is one famous clip of Maldini making four inch perfect slide tackles within just a couple of minutes. Does that mean that he just kept on making mistake after mistake during that passage of play? Of course it doesn't. So I don't know if it's a myth that he said it, though I wouldn't be surprised if it was, but it is certainly a myth that by the very nature of having to make a tackle, successful or otherwise, a player must already have made a mistake. Fifth. Goalkeepers shouldn't get beat at their near post. This is a quote that no goalkeeper has ever uttered or thought to themselves, but a raft of pundits and commentators have decided, between themselves, with next to no understanding of the position, that it is indisputably true. It's one of those statements that just gets repeated so often that people start to believe it, even without any evidence, like, goldfish only have three second memories, you shouldn't swim straight after eating, and if you allow the rich to become super rich and own all of the world's assets, including the house or apartment that you pay them for the right to live in, eventually that wealth will trickle down to you. Admittedly, some myths are more comforting and damaging than others. When you think about it, the idea that a goalkeeper shouldn't get beat at their near post doesn't make any sense. When a goalkeeper positions themselves, the idea is to set themselves up as best as possible to prevent the ball from finding its way into the back of their net. Theoretically, a goalkeeper could stand right in front of their near post and thus save themselves from the supposed humiliation of getting beat at their near post. But all they'd be doing is making it much easier to score against them overall. A goalkeeper's aim ought to be to minimise the likelihood of an opponent scoring, not to minimise the likelihood of being made to look foolish. Increasingly, people who work in football are starting to realise this, including non-goalkeeping coaches. If a player strikes the ball with pace, and particularly with height, from close range, into the top of a goalkeeper's near post, it is extremely difficult to save it. Unfortunately, that message doesn't appear to have quite filtered through to pundits yet, or one or two older coaches who presumably just think that keepers and goalkeeping coaches are making excuses for their own inadequacies. Incidentally, I think that by virtue of goalkeeping being such a specialist position, and there being so few goalkeepers in management, commentary, punditry, and the media more broadly, there is so much misinformation out there about goalkeeping. The idea that keepers should claim anything inside of their six-yard box under any circumstances, that anything they hold on to is therefore a routine save rather than potentially just having been an excellent piece of goalkeeping, or the classic, he or she went with the wrong hand, are all tired old cliches that drive goalkeepers mad. And all goalkeepers know them to be either massive oversimplifications or just total nonsense. No wonder they say that you have to be mad or crazy to be a goalkeeper. That's not to perform the role, it's just to put up with all of the nonsense that surrounds it. Fourth, God just gave Messi a talent while Cristiano had to work for it. That right there is a direct quote from Patrice Sevra, and it is the type of nonsense that I would expect from a man who licks, bites, slaps, and sucks on raw chicken, but it's one that reflects a broader narrative that we are frequently told about the two greatest players of the last 20 years. On the face of it, 
It's not wrong to say that Cristiano Ronaldo has an incredible work rate, trains like the psychopath that he truly is, and has dedicated his life, in terms of his diet, discipline and exercise, to maximising his career in the sport. Nor is it false to say, although the term is a little bit nebulous, that Lionel Messi is very naturally talented, or appears to have a unique God-given talent. Personally, I'm not a religious man, but you get the general sentiment. The myth is the insinuation, both that Messi doesn't or hasn't worked hard, which is just patently false, but is constantly repeated nonetheless, or that Cristiano Ronaldo wasn't also incredibly gifted and talented, as though he were nothing more than a workhorse. In reality, for all of his ability, Messi has had to work incredibly hard to become, in a lot of people's eyes, the greatest footballer of all time. His career began with the adversity of being diagnosed with a growth hormone deficiency at 13, which saw him relocate to Barcelona, who, realising Messi's potential, offered to cover his medical expenses. Throughout his career, Messi has been a ferocious competitor in training, as any of particularly his earlier teammates will attest. His relentless practising turned him from an average into one of the world's greatest free kick specialists, and about 10 years ago, Messi made drastic lifestyle changes, shedding 3 kilos, dropping all alcohol and sugary drink consumption, and moving to an almost entirely meat-free diet, in order to prolong his career at the highest level. Ronaldo, meanwhile, though undoubtedly a terrific athlete and professional, famed for being the first out onto the training ground, the last to leave it, adhering to an uber-strict diet, and having his own personalised exercise regimes, was a freakish talent at the age of 18, even as a skinny little kid, when he was spotted and signed by Manchester United. It is a total myth, and if you're still not convinced, I made an entire video about it a few years ago, that you're free to go and watch after this one. In fact, I would actively encourage it. Third, 2-0 is the most dangerous scoreline in football. Surely, surely, people must know that this one is nonsense by this stage. You would have thought so, wouldn't you? And yet it still keeps on getting repeated. This is a myth so commonly held and repeated that it has its own Wikipedia page. The theory goes that, at 2-0 up, teams are either more likely to become complacent, thus making them more likely to concede and go on to draw or even lose the game, or they are more likely to become indecisive, unsure whether to push for a third goal and increase their lead, or retreat further towards their own goal and look to hold on to what they've got. With that uncertainty, creating a set of circumstances in which chaos can ensue. Of course, any of those possibilities could happen, just as a team could become complacent at 4-0 up like Arsenal at Newcastle in 2011, or be caught in two minds or indecisive at 3-0 up like AC Milan against Liverpool in the 2005 Champions League final. But that doesn't mean that 4-0 or 3-0 are especially dangerous scorelines. The most dangerous scorelines, quite obviously, are when you're losing, not winning, given how key the first goal tends to be in determining the outcome of a football match. Luckily, some people have dug into the numbers, and you will be surprised to discover that Tunnel is not, in fact, the most dangerous scoreline in football. A macro analysis of years of football throughout Europe's top leagues found that in over 90% of cases, a team that takes a Tunnel lead goes on to win a game. In only 2-3% to of cases, does a team that has led 2-0 in a game actually go on to lose, with around 7% of 2-0 leads resulting in draws. As you can see in this chart, 2-0 is a slightly more dangerous lead than 3-0 or 4-0, but a lot less dangerous than 1-0, which, with all due respect, is about what any right-thinking person would surely expect. Ironically, and somewhat amusingly, one of the few times that a pundit has questioned this tired old cliche on live TV was Gary Lineker at halftime in a game where Liverpool were 2 0 up against Bournemouth in 2016. Only for Liverpool to go on to lose 4 3. So, you know, it's not that it's never dangerous, but the most dangerous scoreline in football, it most certainly is not. Having had a good look, I have absolutely no idea where this one comes from. I could only assume that it was copium from a manager after his team spunked a two-goal lead and he was looking for some kind of consolation. And not wanting to upset him, everyone just embellished him and pretended that, yeah, sure Bob, 
2-0 is definitely the most dangerous scoreline. It's not like over 90% of teams who go 2-0 up go on to win the game or anything. Second, football and politics don't mix. Slightly different to some of the other inclusions in this seven, but an absolute classic of the genre nonetheless, you'll be surprised to discover that this is one that I hear particularly often, sometimes even in the comments section of my own videos. It's hard to believe, I know, but you'll just have to take my word for it. The idea that football and politics aren't inextricably linked has always been unsustainable. Heck, the literal origins of the sport in its codified form here in England was a battle between the class interests of the aristocracy, who felt that football was a game that should be played by gentlemen solely for pleasure, and working class factory workers who decided that, do you know what, actually, I'd really rather be paid for my work, but as the years have gone on, that argument has gone from unsustainable to palpably absurd. Many of the world's great rivalries are based on class or political conflicts and differences. Politicians and governments have sought to weaponize football for as long as the sport has enjoyed mass popularity, and those involved in the sport have used their voices and platforms, given to them for the same reason, to either support or oppose a whole raft of political causes. Football isn't unique in this sense. It is impossible to decouple athletes like Jesse Owens or Muhammad Ali from political struggle in the United States, for example. It's just that, as the world's most popular sport, its political potency is often even more pointed. From the grassroots level, where political decisions like austerity can see cuts to local authorities, pitches and coaches, denying children and adults of the most basic accessibility to the sport, to the elite level, where entire countries are now buying clubs as political weapons, to deny the deep connection of football and politics now is to deny the evidence of everyone's own eyes and ears. If football and politics didn't mix, Israel wouldn't be UEFA rather than AFC members, Russia wouldn't have been banned from a World Cup four years after hosting the damn thing, and Newcastle United wouldn't be hosting supposed home Saudi Arabia friendlies or have played in a Saudi cosplay third kit last season. Not only is the idea that football and politics don't mix fundamentally untrue, it's also incredibly selectively applied. The same people who are perfectly happy with displays of nationalism, militarism, and monarchism, all of which are explicitly political, will in some instances rage that football and politics don't mix when it comes to displays or campaigns against racism, homophobia, or misogyny within the game, and vice versa, of course. The idea that football and politics shouldn't mix meanwhile, rather than that they don't mix, I think is equally unrealistic and absurd, but I have made an entire video about that as well, should any of you be interested. So, you know, I'll spare you that diatribe on this occasion. First, the referees are all against us. This is, without a doubt, surely the biggest myth in modern football. I'm sure that football fans have always had persecution complexes. It's much easier to blame a referee for your 15-game winless run than to accept that perhaps your players and manager might just be a bit useless, but recently, things have escalated beyond any and all reasonable explanation. It's no longer the case that fans, players, and managers complain about the odd decision in the odd game every now and then, where they may well have a point, certainly no one suggesting, that referees are infallible, that the rules are always reasonably and correctly applied, or that officials can't make the odd howler just like players. Now we routinely hear about grand conspiracies to see X, Y, or Z promoted, relegated, or whatever else it might be. I talked about this in my video about the increased cult-like tendencies of football fandom, but even in the six short months since that video came out, things have somehow gotten worse. I'm forever hearing that, for whatever reason, the PGMOL are conspiring against Arsenal because Mikel Arteta once stole a car parking space that one of their directors was about to pull into and had already got his indicator on. Or, you know, something to that effect. At the start of this season, I had someone earnestly, and with great conviction, try to convince me on Twitter that there is a bias among the EFL and their referees against Rotherham United. I mean, why? What possible motive would they have? I was once sat near someone at Hull City who was unwavering in his belief that Lions men and women hated Hull City, and that they would stop at nothing to deny us of finishing within the playoffs. Because... 
unforgivably, they had correctly flagged one of our players offside for the second time in the space of 10 minutes. Honestly, you can't even receive the ball from an offside position without one of these bent forth officials flagging you for offside these days. It's political correctness gone mad. Bad decisions happen, no one's denying that, and I think it may even be true that there are certain subconscious biases towards home teams if they have a particularly vocal crowd that gets on top of a ref, or, most notably, towards the big six in the Premier League. But even then, it's marginal, as I say, subconscious, and not part of some grand plan to get Rotherham relegated to League One. Believe me, they're more than capable of doing that all on their own. That is it for today's video. Thank you all, as ever, for watching. It is much appreciated, as YouTube does its best to shut this channel down for no apparent reason. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video, since apparently that helps. And also, you know, I hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts, as always, down below, or now to the side paps in the comments. I also can't say that I'm a fan of that format change if you've got it. And of course, please do make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on, not just for this channel, HITC7s, but also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, which is of particular importance now. I would love it, Kevin Keegan style, if you could all do that. And both channels should be on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might enjoy watching after this one. I will try to include videos that I mentioned in the video you just watched, but, you know, I can't promise anything. I forget these things. Uh, as always, also, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or on threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, should you wish to do so. And all of those links, plus a whole lot more, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.